Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is a great pleasure for me to give a talk in this symposium organised by the Trinity College Science Society. In the next half an hour or so, I'm going to talk about uh, how doctors make decisions and uh, try and think with you about it. So medicine, broadly speaking, aims at recognising and treating various illnesses. The doctor and her patient, whenever possible, join forces in this endeavour. The doctor uses her knowledge and skills to take a good clinical history from the patient, understand what the problem is, and the patient's preferences, concerns and expectations around it. She then, using all this information, does what can be done medically to help the patient recover from their illness. As a form of applied science, medicine uses insight and methodologies from both the natural and social sciences. During this talk, I will first describe two frameworks of clinical theory and skills, evidence-based medicine or EBM and values-based practice or VBP. I will then focus on a specific skill within VBP, knowledge about values in healthcare. And in the third part of my talk, I'm going to explore how the personal histories of the patient and the clinician can influence their values and thereby their decisions, as well as the impact of the history of medicine on this. In the developed world, over the last two decades, evidence-based medicine or EBM has become the dominant approach to help us choose between various diagnostic and treatment options. The objective of EBM is to replace intuition anecdotal evidence and subjective clinical experience with the examination objective of objective evidence from clinical research, using formal rules to appraise the available evidence. The gold standard of EBM is the Randomised Control Trial, or RCT. Now, RCTs are commonly used in the process of approving new medical interventions. They are designed to test if a new medication, for example, is effective at treating a certain condition and how safe it is to use it in real life patients. Patients with the condition are randomly allocated into either an active treatment group receiving the medication or a control group which receives placebo, for example, an identical looking pill. Ideally, the patients and the clinicians evaluating their clinical improvement should not know which patients receive the medication and which ones the placebo. This is referred to as double blind. Improvement is usually measured with validating rating instruments measuring symptom severity or by looking at the number of looking at the number of patients who got better or cured or survived over a certain period of time. Various statistical tests are run to see if any differences between the two groups are significant. When there have been more than one trials conducted using a particular intervention and they are sufficiently similar to each other, their results can be meta-analyzed to produce an overall statistic. Meta-analyses use sophisticated statistics and can be seen as the pinnacle of evidence-based medicine, but the quality of their findings depend on the individual studies included in that analysis and the methodological rigor with which they were conducted. The Cochrane Handbook provides detailed guidance on every aspect of how to do a meta-analysis for inclusion in their database of systematic reviews. The results not only tell you about the efficacy of the treatment, but also about the quality of the evidence. This gives the doctor and the patient an idea about how likely it is that future research may change our understanding. So in our Cochrane review on antidepressants for treating depression in dementia, we concluded that the available evidence is of variable quality and does not provide strong support for the efficacy of antidepressants for treating depression in dementia, especially beyond 12 weeks. And the only measure of efficacy for which we had high quality evidence, and that was depression rating scale scores, antidepressants showed little or no effect. The evidence on remission rates favoured antidepressants, but was of moderate quality. 
so future research may find a different result. There was insufficient evidence to draw conclusions about individual antidepressants or about subtypes of dementia or depression. There's some evidence that antidepressant treatment may cause adverse events. However, there are two important points to make here. First, many treatments are still not evidence-based, as the evidence base just doesn't exist in the format required by EBM. And second, evidence-based medicine can tell us what proportion of patients will get better or completely cured with certain types of treatment and what proportion will develop such and such side effects. But it is silent about the personal importance attached to these by patient and doctor, that is their relevant values. This may be fine, for example, when there is no real choice, or most people would have the same values about the intervention in question. If, for example, someone collapsed with a heart attack and stopped breathing, most people would agree that we should try and do something about it. We should give breaths and chest compressions. It is, however, rarely so simple in everyday clinical practice. For example, there may be several treatment options and one treatment might be more likely to be effective than others, but also carry a higher risk of side effects. Or the side effects might be particularly severe or irreversible or simply unknown, especially with new treatments. So a um, rather topical example would be COVID vaccination. For the patient, there is the choice of whether to have it or not although the majority would accept the vaccine if offered, varying proportions of people in different countries would not, according to a Nature Medicine article published in February. The research showed that age, gender, income, education levels, infection and death rates in the local population, and trust in the government also influenced acceptance rates. This suggests that factors related to values as opposed to scientific evidence are also likely at play in people's decisions. For the authorities and the government, there is a choice of which vaccines to use and how to prioritize various groups within the population. There's also some choice for the doctor, for example, when discussing the vaccine with patients who may be hesitant about it. All of these conversations will involve values. To help doctors and patients to navigate the inherent value diversity in healthcare, another important complementary framework of clinical theory and skills called values-based practice or VBP has been developed. The objective of VBP is to facilitate a good process whereby values involved in clinical decision-making can be fully recognized and then balanced productively. VBP draws on psychology, sociology, anthropology and law, and to navigate this complexity, philosophy. In the natural sciences, often there's just one right answer. In clinical practice, this is often not the case. This is due to a number of factors. The first one we have already described. In clinical practice, there are often multiple choices with significant diversity in the values attached to them. Also, certain elements of medicine are not driven by exact science, but personal experience of the patient and um, the clinician, the history and traditions of the specialty, the legal environment, government policies, current codes of practice, and cultural influences, all of which relate to values of those involved. So in order to be able to apply science to clinical practice well, we need to be familiar with these values. Our knowledge of the relevant values and the ability to work with them effectively can help us facilitate a good process that enables the patient and the clinician or clinical team to make decisions that they can accept and own. The starting point in VBP is respect for differences. This, however, doesn't mean that all things are acceptable. Framework values are limits beyond which none of us would be prepared to go. These are the values that are genuinely shared between all of us. For example, doctors cannot be expected to perform an intervention that they believe would be harmful to the patient's health, even if the patient is asking for that in intervention to be carried out. We have referred to good process before 
good process in the context of VBP refers to the inclusion and balancing of the values of those involved in the clinical decision making process. It's a bit similar to political democracy. As outlined by Professor Bill Fulford, VBP provides 10 key pointers to good process. For the purposes of this talk today, I will focus on the four practice skills, awareness, reasoning, knowledge and communication. Awareness in this context is the skill to recognize that not just facts, but also values are at play in a clinical situation, even when it is not obvious. This is sometimes referred to as value blindness. Another practice skill is the ability of reasoning about values. VBP, similar to bioethics, deploys a variety of methods, including case-based and principle-based reasoning, utilitarianism or consequentialism, or rights-based reasoning. The difference is that in VBP, it is always in order to open up value perspectives rather than to close them down, like in bioethics, by establishing the right values to have in a particular case. Knowledge of values refers to knowing what people, what values people may have in a certain clinical situation. And in the third part of my talk, I'm going to further explore knowledge with regard to the impact of history, personal or collective, on values. Communication in VBP includes the balancing of different value perspectives and resolving conflict between them. Also relevant to uh, the third part of my talk, VBP emphasizes that clinical decision making involves partnership between those who are directly concerned, that is the patients and the clinicians involved in the case. So spending time with the above can pay dividends in clinical practice in many ways. Patient and carer satisfaction, better treatment adherence, better staff retention are just a few examples. But one might ask, how does VBP fit with the current practice in medical training and clinical care? Is there time for discussing values when healthcare is increasingly driven by targets, guidelines, schools of practice, manualized medicine, care pathways, and packages of care? Tending to our patients' concerns, preferences, and expectations has always been part of good medical practice. What is new is having the theory and skills supporting this organized into a framework. VBP principles have gradually become part of the narrative of health and social care practice. The need to embrace the core principles of VBP, such as patient-centered care, cultural competence, patient choice, and co-production is very much present in current thinking in the NHS. As a psychiatrist, I have the most in-depth knowledge of the psychiatric curricula. The curriculum approved by uh, the General Medical Council for core training lists VBP skills among the intended learning outcomes, and the curricula for specialist training require the trainee to demonstrate an understanding of VBP. A report commissioned by the GMC also recognizes the ability to navigate conflicting values as a senior medical leadership quality. As I said earlier, the first step in VBP is simply to recognize that not just facts, but also values are at play in the situation being considered. But what are values and how can we recognize them? A simple short definition would be that values are things or actions that are important to us. Values can be expressed in various logical forms, such as needs, wishes, or preferences. In healthcare, this could present as concerns, preferences, and expectations related to medical investigations or treatment. In VBP, the first call for information is the perspective of the patient or the patient group. Sometimes doc the doctor can develop a good understanding of her patient's relevant values just by talking about this with her patient. Sometimes this is not possible. Fortunately, there is a rapidly increasing knowledge base out there to help with this, including collections of first-hand narratives, ethnographic studies, and social science research from anthropology, history, law, and polit politics with a focus on health and illness. The diversity of relevant values can also be grasped from media reports, literature, theater, 
and film portrayal of illness. There are also philosophical methods that can be used in order to understand the values present in the patient's uh, narrative. These include linguistic analytic philosophy, hermeneutics, discursive analysis, and phenomenology. Importantly, VBP also takes into consideration the values of the doctor or clinician. It can be easier for the doctor to understand her patient's value perspective if she understands her own. But where do her values as a doctor come from? We develop our values during the entire course of our life. She will bring hers from her personal history as a daughter, sister, mother, friend and doctor. They are shaped by influences from those close to her and the cultural cultures she has lived in. And some will be rooted in the history of her profession, medicine, and within that her specialty. So in this sense, from a VBP perspective, it is possible to conceive of three meanings for history taking. First, exploring the patient's history. This includes the history of presenting complaints, past medical history, family history, personal history, etc. as every part can reveal important information about the patient's values and can have implications for treatment choice and treatment adherence. Second, the doctor, uh, doctor's personal history. Developing an understanding of that uh, will be important in understanding um, how these affect her own value perspectives. And third, becoming aware of the history of medicine and the specialty itself, which shapes the doctor's attitudes and expectations, as well as those of the patient and society. The patient's personal history, why is it important? Taking the patient's clinical history is obviously important for, for the facts gathered from it, but it is also an essential tool in establishing rapport and an empathetic understanding of the patient. As Arlene Bowers Andrews in her book entitled Social History Assessment points out, helping professions among which she counts um, medicine, nursing, psychiatry, psychology, counseling or social work, and also ministry and law, have a long tradition of exploring and working with social histories as a tool to promote healing and growth, and I would add recovery. Studies from fields like anthropology, sociology, genetics, criminology, psychology, social work, education, journalism and history all provide evidence about how meaning and context can influence human behaviour. The patient's narrative has always been important in all branches of medicine, but perhaps never taken centre stage quite as much as in psychiatry, both in diagnosis making and in treatment. Bruner distinguishes between the life lived this is the milestones, critical incidents, and key decision points. The life experienced, this is the meanings, images, feelings, and thoughts of the person. And the life as told, the unique personal narrative, which is influenced by the cultural conventions of storytelling, the audience, and social context. In a clinical encounter, the life experienced is communicated through the life as told which is especially intertwined with one's value systems. Andrews describes the process, how the health professional explores the history of the patient in her wording the client. She listens to the patient telling his or her story and then contributes her own interpretations. She complements the patient's personal narrative from other sources of information, such as other people's views. This is called in medicine, collateral history and previous records. The professional uses her knowledge and skills from theory and past experience and shares her interpretations with the patient. She reflects carefully on her own interpretations in order to distinguish them from those of the patients. I would like to point out that this is a joint hermeneutic activity. As Andrews also observes, the clinician becomes part of the story. Woodbridge and Fulford describe a particularly interesting and challenging aspect of this joint work, calling it the problem of two languages. The patient describes a personal desire, problem or event in ordinary language. This is then translated by the doctor or other health professional into work language. 
such as symptom or social functioning. She may use work language to communicate with the patient using terms like assessment and care plan, which the patient has to translate back into ordinary language. This often becomes a problem when a word has a very different meaning in ordinary language compared to medicine. For example, in the case of depression, where the lay and medical meanings can instead be indeed very, be very far apart. This can lead to at least two major problems. First, a substantial amount of meaning is lost in translation. And second, the doctor can inadvertently shape the way the patient thinks of his or her experience and thereby change the nature of the symptoms. To give you an example from um, psychiatry, a patient may describe several of his neighbors saying awful things about him as a thought, and the doctor may ask him to tell her more about these voices, thinking the patient is describing auditory hallucinations. One way to avoid this is to ask the patient to describe their symptoms in as much detail as possible before trying to categorize them in any way. Exploring the patient's personal history in a medical context is a very special situation. In psychiatry, for example, patients often say they have shared more with the clinician than with anyone else before about their lives. This can include some of the saddest or happiest moments of their lives, their greatest regrets or most intimate hopes. This is often an Im Im immensely powerful emotional experience and can have either a liberating or a destabilizing effect on the patient. As Owens, Wesley and Murray point out in their handbook of practical psychiatry, the interview can also have value as a psychotherapeutic intervention. With the help of the clinician, patients can gain new insights into their problems. And importantly, during the process of exploring their history, patients can change their personal narrative. This can enable them to develop more adaptive interpretations of their experience and to use healthier ways of coping. In other words, they can start moving toward recovery. Recovery in this context doesn't necessarily mean becoming symptom free, but tackling one's mental health problems with hope and optimism and working towards a valued lifestyle within and beyond the limits of any mental health problem. Helping the patient change their narrative is also an important aspect of the healing process in other specialties especially those dealing with long-term chronic conditions. An example could be diabetes, for example. The more a treatment decision fits with the patient's narrative, the more likely it is that they will fully engage with the treatment. This is just to give you an illustration of the various values that can be present when exploring uh, the reasons for referral which is the first part of history taking in the memory clinic. Patients, and I can tell you clinicians, feel more uncomfortable if the referral was primarily the idea of someone other than the patient. Patients can have strong preferences about whether they would like a family member to be present when they are interviewed, and sometimes they prefer not to be told their diagnosis. This may make assessment less stressful for them, but it makes it much more difficult for the clinical team to support the patient and their family. An exploration of exactly what the patient means by not being told the diagnosis may reveal that their preference is not absolute. They could be, for example, perfectly happy to take a memory medication used in Alzheimer's disease, if indicated. They just don't want, to, don't want the word Alzheimer's or dementia to be used in, in their presence. Exploration of the patient's past medical history, personal or social histories can reveal other important values that will influence what decisions will be made in a similar fashion. Now, the life history of the clinician is a less discussed source of the values at play in clinical decision-making. Is it important? Well, once, one, once very influential movement, certainly thought so, psychoanalysis. Although some registering bodies still require psychotherapy trainees to complete a certain number of hours of personal therapy, the only psychotherapy school that really took the personal history of the therapist into account was psychoanalysis. 
so much so that therapists usually have to undergo personal, personal analysis before being allowed to treat patients. One psychoanalytic term still present in medical student teaching is countertransference. It refers to feelings and reactions evoked in the clinician by the patient due to the clinician's personal history and or the patient's behavior. Examining countertransference is a kind of self-reflective activity. It is a powerful tool and it can improve our understanding of our patients and our empathy. A modern day tendency in professional appraisal, licensing and CPD is the increasing requirement of the clinicians to use reflection in, in their practice. Although reflective practice includes examining one's own emotional responses to clinical situations and one's needs and preferences regarding the future, it is usually focused on their clinical work and there's no explicit requirement to relate one's work-related values to one's own life history. One may, of course, find it helpful to do that in, in their own uh, time or with a trusted colleague, with preferably with no managerial responsibility or conflict of interest, such as a mentor working elsewhere. One source of information on how the personal history of the clinician can influence their professional practice is autobiographical writings of prominent personalities in uh, medicine and biographies about them. In his book, The, Th the Story of a Mental Hospital, Fullborn, 1858 to 1983, David Clark writes eloquently about how his own life experiences shaped the values he held about psychiatry. He was appointed medical superintendent of Fullborn Hospital at the age of 32 and worked in that capacity from 1953 to 1971. He was the son of a medical scientist and grew up in Edinburgh. He studied medicine at Cambridge and Edinburgh and qualified in 1943. He spent three years in the army before training in psychiatry with some of the most prominent psychiatrists of the time, Sir David Henderson at the Royal Edinburgh Hospital and Sir Aubrey Lewis at the Moodsley in London. Uh, there he underwent personal psychoanalysis and trained in individual and group psychotherapy under the founder of group analytic psychotherapy, S.H. Fuchs. He described, Clark described how in 1945, he saw the horrors of the Nazi concentration camps and later oversaw a camp of 2000 Dutch civilians and negotiated with them um, and the Japanese to avoid a massacre by the Indonesian nationalists. These experiences, he writes, showed me the abominable things people would willingly do to one another and left me with a deep distaste for locking anybody up. End of quote. Clark was instrumental in unlocking the wards at Fullborn by 1958. Under Clark's leadership, Fullborn became an internationally renowned center of social treatment. Now, of course, not all of us have an extraordinary life like Clark did, but we all have our own significant life events, some happy and some upsetting, which influence what we regard as important in the way we relate to others including our patients. Now, is there any empirical research about the influence of the doctor's personal history on her work as a clinician? The concept of the wounded healer, that is, that personal experience of illness can influence one's therapeutic endeavors in a helpful way, has been around for a long time. One situation that has been studies, studied is when the clinician has the same condition as the patient. There has been less research about the effects of the clinician's life history in general. So personal history of migraine, for example, leads to a more somatic view of migraine as a disorder and to different treatment recommendations to the patient as compared to self-treatment. GP's treatment choice for depression is influenced by gender, personal history of psychotherapy or antidepressant treatment, and history of depression in someone close. Or to give you another example, psychiatric, psychology, pediatric and social work professionals responsible for evaluating child sexual abuse allegations who had been sexually abused or physically abused themselves were more likely to believe allegations of sexual abuse contained in case vignettes. And finally, 
a special case is peer support workers. Their input in mental health has been shown to reduce rehospitalization rates in patient days, lower costs and increased quality of life outcomes and has benefits for peer support workers themselves. Um, and uh, to come to the final bit of my talk, the values of both the patient and the clinician are also influenced in a less direct way by history at a collective level. Here, I will cite a couple of examples from my own field psychiatry, but there are some parallels in other special specialties too. Medical practice doesn't occur in a vacuum. It's always embedded in the cultural context of the era. Culture influences what we regard as illness, or what can be considered as treatment, appropriate treatment or humane treatment. David Clark, in his above mentioned book, quotes the Earl of Hardwick's speech at the laying of the foundation stone of Fullborn Asylum in 1856. Talking about the care of the mental ill in the past, the Earl described a rather large change in the expected prognosis and values, claiming that, quote begins, in most cases, the patient can be restored to mental soundness, end of quote. We know from the records that the reality for most, if not all, turned out to be different until the 1950s. As an old age psychiatrist, I still frequently find a strong fear in some of my elderly patients about even having an outpatient appointment in Fullborn, more than 150 years on from the foundation of the asylum. When you were carted off to Fullborn, it was rare that you could ever go home again. Although the asylum as a model is long gone, the idea that coercion can be necessary in certain situations is still very much present. An important factor influencing uh, the values of the general public, which includes patients and carers, is the gap or time lag between public understanding and actual current practice in psychiatry. Public understanding often seems to reflect earlier practice or sometimes simply an inaccurate image. A significant proportion of patients and carers have misgivings about psychiatry and some are decidedly critical of it. It is reasonable to assume that many of the current criticisms have been the result of viewing past practices retrospectively, taking them out of their historical context and comparing them to our current standards. And this is very different from how historians approach past medical practices. They try to understand the past in its own context. Claire Hilton, the resident historian of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, uses the example of malaria inoculation. She points out that it was a dangerous, but in many curative treatment for general paralysis of the insane. This is a manifestation of neurosyphilis. Julius Wagner Jaurek got the Nobel Prize for it. Hilton explains that a retrospective hindsight analysis would discredit the treatment, whilst a historical analysis that explores the context, including the prevailing values, attitudes, and the choices available at the time, would not. So to summarize, Decisions in medical practice are influenced by not just facts from biomedical research, but also the values of the patient and the health professionals involved. Values permeate medicine. Sometimes they are shared. This is when we tend not to notice them. And sometimes they conflict. Evidence-based medicine is usefully complemented by its parallel framework of values-based practice. Values-based practice provides a clinical theory and skills to help health professionals apply the science in everyday clinical practice productively. History taking is a good source of information about values. If done well, it offers an opportunity to understand the context of the patient's symptoms and to help the patient change their personal narrative in an adaptive way. BBP takes into consideration the values of both the patient and the clinician these values will guide treatment decisions too. Finally, some of the values involved in clinical decision making come from the collective history of the profession, the history of medicine.
Thank you very much.